So you could have a million dollars. <laughs> All right, brother. Yeah, there you go. All right, brother. It's just a million dollars. That's right. All right. All right. You know, it's funny. I, when I think about that, we, if this was real, you could imagine the excitement. There'd be people coming through the doors. You'd be on social media. If it was real, we'd be all excited. But in heaven, it's no different than if this was a real one down on, on earth. I don't even think they make million-dollar bills, right? But um, uh, and God, God has to be like, why do you get so excited over a piece of paper? I mean, he, he has to be going, when, when I get myself bent out of shape because of lack of a piece of paper, or because the numbers on the piece of paper aren't large enough, I don't have enough zeros on there, God has to go, it's papers and zeros. What is your big deal? Why do you even care about a piece of paper? But that's neither here nor there. But I am a part of the Million Dollar Man Club today. Everyone raise up your million dollars. Who is part of the Million Dollar Man Club today? Right on, right on. So funny, a bit part of the Million Dollar Man Club. I'm so broke, I can't even afford to pay attention. It's Father's Day. You have to start off with a Father's Day for, with a dad's joke, right? In fact, now, at my age, no matter when I try to be funny, no matter where I go, if I'm around some teenager or some kid somewhere, they call it a dad joke. No matter, it's all the same joke I used to say forever because I always have the same jokes. That's why I travel because I only have like three jokes, right? I don't have like three sermons. I travel all around, but all of a sudden now all my humor is dad humor probably because of my age and maybe my, my other things in my life, too, that made me think it's about that. But uh, today, I, I'm not, I, today is difficult because of what I want to do. Probably scares some of you. It's already difficult as it is because, number one, I'm talking to you right before lunch. And I don't know if you caught the, the aroma of the bratwurst yet, but I caught it right away during worship. And I'm supposed to keep your attention I know what you guys are doing. You're like, this is the best way to get Steve short. Have him cook the barbecue out there, let it come wafting in, like turn the fans on, open up the doors, I'll be done in just a matter of as fast as I can say amen, right? But, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is I don't, you already know my brain. My brain is a little bit, well, I guess the, the term for it would probably be ADD or ADHD or some. I got a lot of D's, so maybe that has something to, to do with it. I don't know. But my brain is, it's all over the place. That's how God made me, period. That's just how God made me. Maybe society had a little bit to do with that, too. But that, my brain is always working. My buddy said to me the other day, he says, I said, man, I'm just tired today. I don't know why I'm tired. He laughed at me. I said, what? He said, if my brain analyzed everything like your brain does 100% of the time, he says, I'd be tired all the time as well. That's how my brain goes. I've got lint rollers in my head. I got Top Gun in my head. I got Too Broke to Pay Attention in my head. I got Father's Day in my head. And I'm not exactly sure how it's all going to come out, but truth be told, most of the time when I come here, that's how I feel. I just don't, I'm just not that honest with you to tell you that. I'm not that vulnerable with you. But that's how my brain works. As I'm speaking, God will pull something out of my brain and set it on here and say, talk about that next. And I'll go, oh, that's really good. How many times, you, you've noticed when I've talked and all of a sudden I'll mention something and you wait for the response to that and it never comes. You're like, Steve, you, where's the answer? Where you, you never finish your sentence. And then at the very last sentence I speak, there's the answer. I didn't plan that. I just forgot about it. And then God at the end says, oh, don't forget, you got to, oh, yeah, that's right. And inside I'm going, man, that was brilliant. That's like a movie or something. That's genius. But out, and it's, I know, it, I know it, was just, it was just the Holy Spirit. It was just God's Spirit kind of guiding me. Happy Father's Day to all of you. Everyone at home, happy Father's Day. Where's the camera at? There it is. Happy Father's Day at home. We're glad that you are watching this online. My, my struggle, see, I haven't even got to the struggle yet. I can't even get to the struggle. My struggle is I travel a lot. I speak to a lot of people. And not just when I speak for churches or schools or whatever. Everywhere I go, I talk to people. If you know me, I ask people questions. I like to dive in right away. Life is too short to play around with just small talk. I like to find out what's going on with you. How are you really doing? And they say, fine. I never let them get away with fine. But I want to know how you're really doing. I'm not just throwing some words in the air. To, otherwise, I would just say hi. But when I ask you how you're doing, I want to know how you're doing. So I'll jump right into it. And there's something that I have found everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. 
When I talk to people about parenting, about their kids, sooner or later, regret comes out of their mouth. That's why I have a table over there. That's why I make product. That's why I'm all about happy. This happy face isn't like all the other happy faces. Because God's happy is different than man's happy. It's something that God birthed in me a long time ago. I'm not going to curse the darkness. I'm not going to curse my leadership. I'm not going to curse the gas prices. I'm just going to increase the happy around. When you're happy, you can handle $6 a gallon. You can handle $10 a gallon. You got a million dollars. What are you worried about? God is our source. If God is our source, then it's time to put that to the test. And I'm tired of the body of Christ. I'm supposed to be representing the good news of God. Being so discouraged and angry and down all the time. Oh boy, we didn't get our person in office. Or maybe you think you got your person in office. I don't really know. I don't really care, honestly. God is my king, and he's the one I serve. And he said to support those that are in leadership over me. And there's no reason for us to be down and not us to be out. But that's hard to do because life just, every time you go to the pump, you sure say whatever you want to say, Steve. But you look at the ting, 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 10, 20, 30, 90, 100, 150, 160 bucks in your it's, at that point, it's real easy to lose your happy, to lose the joy of your salvation. God wants us to be happy. He tells us over and over in the Bible again, he wants us to be full of life. And then God wants me to spread that message in a world of darkness, in a world of anger, in a world of anxiety. You can curse the darkness or you can just stink and turn a switch and turn the light on. And that's what that happy life is all about. It's a happy light. It's the light of God that makes darkness go away. And that's why I spread the happy that I do, because the world needs that right now. The world is looking for it everywhere, but they're looking for it the wrong way. They're, they're looking at the little yellow smiley face. Get rid of the bad, increase the good, I become happy. Then all my happiness is based upon what I can achieve, what I can get, what I can accomplish. I got a million dollars today, I can be happy. But when the million dollars doesn't come, I can't be happy anymore. But God shows up and says, I got a joy that goes deeper than that. I got a happy that you can be happy no matter what the circumstances come. It doesn't matter who is in office, who's not in office. It doesn't matter what your bank account says. They're just pieces of paper with zeros on them. I've got your back. I feel hypocritical even talking about this today. But I'm talking to myself. God does it to me all the time. He says, say this, Steve. I start the sentence, and before the sentence is done, he says, now I want you to listen to what you're about to say. Well, I hate it when he does that. If it comes out of your mouth, I can fight it, fight it off. I can, well, that's just, that's just Pastor Russ, or he doesn't even know who I am, or you don't know me. I can fight that off. When I say it, it's, I can't fight it off because then, I mean, you understand the problem there. Welcome to my brain. I still haven't gotten to the problem yet. The problem is I'm trying to spread happy to a world that's sad. And I said to my buddy online the other day, I'm just, gonna, I'm just been increasing my online presence like crazy. That's all I know how to do. The world is out there. The world needs to find out that there is hope, that there is happy out there, and it's waiting for them. And everyone can get it. If you had to pick between this million dollars or being happy, which would you pick? Honestly, don't even answer. But which would you really pick? Because we think this makes us happy. But if this makes us happy, then everyone who's rich would be happy. which may be true, then why are so many people with money so unhappy? Because they're not rich. You find someone who'll admit they're rich. You know they're rich. You know why? Because they have more money than you. They're rich. I have never met any in my whole life that says I'm rich. And I've met people with a lot of money, a lot more money than me. They'll never say they're rich. No one ever admits they're rich. It's always the next level that's rich. The problem with that philosophy is when I get to that next level, so when I don't have what I try to do, I try to accomplish. I try to attain what I don't have. So if I'm not rich now, but you are, then I am earnestly trying to get where you're at so then I can be rich. The problem is when I get where you're at, I realize, oh, I'm not rich. It's those guys that are rich. No one ever admits they're rich. There's a problem with that. 
Because if you're not rich, you're poor. And a poor mentality is this. What does a poor mentality look at? A poor mentality says what they don't have. A poor mentality looks at what other people have and looks at what they don't have. That's the opposite of happiness. It's the opposite of contentment. When Paul said, I've learned to be content whether I'm rich or poor, whether I'm starving or overstuffed, I've learned to be content. That word can be translated into the word happy. That's what happy means, to be content with who I am, where I am right now, despite my circumstances. That's a happy that can't be shaken from people. When you say you're not rich, then you're poor. When you're poor, I only focus on what I don't have and what everybody else has. When you say you're rich, it's the opposite. What do you focus on when you say you're rich? What do you focus on? What you have. What you own. The question is, now you're ready to take the next step. What am I going to do with it? When you're rich, you realize, man, I'm a million-dollar man club. Now what am I going to do with this? When you're poor, you realize the other people that have the million-dollar man club, you're not, and you try so hard to get there so one day that you can be rich as well. But when you say that you're poor, that's what you, you do. When you say you're rich, you say, wait a minute. I'm rich. Here's all the stuff I have. Now what am I going to do with it? Amen? Psalms 103, starting with verse 6, says this. This is so good. Well, I think it's good. You might not think it's good. Don't you like when people do that? It's like you don't have a choice. And that's, that's good. It's called manipulation. Oh, this is so good. You're going to love this. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you. That's good manipulation right there. All right, so. Psalm 103, verse 6 says, God makes everything, someone say everything, come out what? Then is there a problem? All, all the problem means is that it's time for a solution. All the problem means there's an answer around the corner. That's what problem means, because to have a problem means you have to have an answer. The two go hand in hand. With God, all things come out what? Say it again. All things come out what? What are we worried about? It's a good question. What am I worried about? I'll tell you what I'm worried about. I'm worried about a lot of things. I don't want to talk about those today. I've already talked with God all the way up here today from Maple Valley. I talked with him all about that. And I gave it to him. God makes everything come out right. He puts victims back on their what? Feet. He showed Moses how he went about his work. He was showing Moses what he did, how he did it, opened up out his plans to all of Israel. He said, this is what I'm doing. God is sheer mercy and grace, not easily angered. He's rich in what? He's what in love? He's what in love? Who is? So if I have the mind of Christ, what am I? I'm rich. I have something. I don't know, maybe some of you, if I was sitting out there, I know if someone would tell me that I was rich, I'd just start laughing. I might roll my eyes. I might go out and get an early bratwurst. I might come up and punch you. I might slap you. I might pull a Will Smith on you. I don't know. Like I said, I'm rich, really. I'm too poor. I, I'm so poor I can't even afford to pay attention. There's some truth to that, by the way. When you pay for something, what are you doing? Aren't you buying it? When you pay for something, you're buying it. When you pay attention to something, you are buying that so that you can bring it home, so that you can own it. If you're too broke to pay attention, you're simply paying attention to your poverty. Like Henry Ford said, whether you believe I can or you believe I can't, you're right. When I focus on what I don't have, I buy that again and again and again. Being rich? How many pair of shoes do you own? How many TVs do you own? Do you own a car? Do you have a house with a roof on it, whether you own it or rent it? Do you have a friend that would take one for you? Do you have friends that you would take one in the back for them? 
What about your health? Do you have both feet? Do you have one arm? Do you have an eye that works? At least one? Do you even have a pair of shoes? A lot of people in the world would call you rich. It's time you call yourself that. It all depends on where you're paying attention. My problem is this, is that I too struggle with the kind of parent I was. Parenting just comes up and slaps you in the face. Maybe it doesn't with some of you guys. Maybe I'm just talking about me right now, but I go across the country and people keep talking about their kids and where their kids hang, ended up and who they're hanging out with and what they're learning and what their viewpoints are. And they don't vote for your team anymore. They might not even vote for your God anymore. You don't, you don't know where they're at. And so you begin to beat yourself up and tell yourself what a poor parent you've been. Parenting is not easy. Well, it used to be easy. And then I had kids. And from that moment on, just watch Top Gun for the second time last week. God talks to me in movies. We go to movies all the time. Me and Jesus. Just me and Jesus. No one else will go with me. I just got to go with Jesus. When that first Top Gun came out, it was a blockbuster. It broke all the records. It was very popular. But if you pay attention to the movie, in the movie it's about, a, it's about Maverick who blew it all the time. He was overconfident. He was over cocky. People didn't like him. And he lost his wingman probably because of his cockiness. The first movie was all about his mistakes, but it was a blockbuster. You know why? Because at the end, he took out that old F-16, he shot down those MiG bombers or whatever they, whatever they were, right? It's got to be the longest sequel between two movies ever. 36 years before Top Gun 2 comes out. Top Gun 2, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's the same thing. Guy is overconfident, flies F-16s, Right? But he knows that he lost his wingman last time. So he's kind of lost a lot of that cockiness that he has. Life has shown up. But it's still a blockbuster. Maybe some of you are young enough in here, like Bethany's, you know, Bethany's husband, right? Josh, who's about to have a baby. Oh, he's about ready to start his blockbuster. He knows the kind of dad he's going to be, just like you knew the kind of dad you were going to be. I could be like those other dads. I'll tell you that right now. My kid's going to eat his vegetables. I don't care. Oh, I love it when I go to houses like that. Not in this house. You're going to eat your vegetables. All right. I'll just come visit you seven years from now. Uh, we don't have any chicken nuggets left. Do you want to run to the store and get some more? We got steak on the table. He didn't like steak. You got it. You know what I'm saying? When that first blockbuster starts, you don't know anything. You're confident. You know the kind of father you're going to be. And then you lose your wingman. And then life gets really busy and really stressful because you're trying to raise funds for your son to live, your daughter to live. You're trying to take care of your family. You're trying to get them a cabin maybe. You're trying to get them something where we could actually go out to eat every once in a while. You're, you're trying to work really hard and you're trying to do all these things for your kid, but you lose your wingman somewhere along the way and you believe it's your fault. And maybe it even was your fault. I can tell you dozens of things that I've done wrong. And I wish I could take them back. That's my problem. I have a heart to go into every parent in the world, every parent at least that I come across with, and say, you are not a failure. You're not perfect, but congratulations. Welcome to the human race. No one parents their kids perfectly. You cannot, but that's the point. Parenting isn't about raising kids perfectly. It's about loving them even when you blow it, even when you lose your wingman. It's time for the next blockbuster. Being a dad, being a parent is like being a human lint roller. You just try to get off all the junk off your kid's life. All the wrong thinking, all the mistakes, all the sin, all the dirt all the wrong mentalities, all the wrong, right? You just use a, you're trying to clean up your kid. I had three boys, and they're all drummers. Try keeping them clean, 
right? And those stupid lint rollers, they last for about three times, and they're no good anymore. They don't take the lint off anymore. I was like, babe, this lint roller is broken. She said, well, let me see it. She looked at it, she goes, it's full of lint. I said, I know, it worked until then. What she do? she peels the skin off. There's a fresh, well, I'm like, what's that? It works now. When we have a mentality, we pay attention to where we failed, we buy that, and we bring it back. Now, listen to me. We need to own our failures. But we don't need to keep buying them over and over and over again. It's time to peel that thing off the lint roller. It's time for the next blockbuster. Because if you don't take off that dirt, that sin, that lint, if you don't peel that off every day, his mercies are new every morning. Every morning we get a new start, a brand new lint roller that has unlimited lint things until we're done. Unlimited skins on there until we're done. But what happens if you don't peel that off? If you keep paying attention to your brokenness, you keep paying attention to your failures, you keep paying attention to what you did wrong, you keep buying over and over, you keep owning that same thing over and over and over. I'm not a very good Christian, I'm not a very good parent, I'm not a very good husband, I'm not a very good worker, I'm not a very good boss, I'm not a very good, we all know all the lies. Because the enemy, he's, he's, he's stuck in a rut. He tells us all the same stuff. All the failures we are. You got to look at it. You got to peel it off. And you got to give it back to God. You got to let him throw it in the trash. Otherwise, you're a lint roller that no longer picks up lint. And you can never start the second blockbuster ever. You just can't. Because what you're made for is no longer working because you're still holding on to. You're still paying attention. You're still buying your failure. Your mistakes, your uneasiness. Million Dollar Man Club? Oh man, the million dollar. You know who the million dollar man was? Ted DiBiase. Anyone know who that is? Oh, all star wrestler. Don't ask me how I would know that I read about it. I wouldn't watch Ted DiBiase or anyway, because if I watched him, I would have seen that he always said the same line Every man has his price. Priceline has, name your price tool. Every man has his price. From the million dollar man, that's what he says. Every man has his price. And his whole shtick, his whole character in all-star wrestling, in worldwide wrestling, whatever it was back in the day. Not, I, see, I don't know. I, I, never, I never. Was, oh, you have your price. In other words, what that statement is saying is there's somewhere down the line, somewhere down the line, that I can get you to sell out. You can get desperate enough that you'll do what you don't want to do because every man has its price. Name your price. What's your price? We've just got it off just a little bit. All we have to do is change one word of that. Isaiah says that God's ways aren't like our ways. His thoughts aren't like our thoughts. They're higher than our thoughts. Jesus showed up and no one got him because he was like, he doesn't talk like all the other guys. This Jesus shows up and he puts it all in his ear. He said, you say, you know, that adultery is wrong. I say if you lust after somebody, it's the same thing. We're like, what? Ho, 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 wait a second. Jesus was pulling stuff like that all the time. He says, love your neighbor. What are you, what? Those that despisely despise you and they reject you and say all manner of evil against you, bless them. Jesus showed up and his ways aren't like our ways. Jesus wouldn't say every man has his price. He'd say every man has his value. One word changes everything. You pay attention to your brokenness or you can pay attention to your successes. You can pay attention to your price or you can pay attention to your worth. Name your price tool. Name your price. How much are you willing to pay for that? Name your worth. Do you think you can outname God's worth for you? Do you think all this stack of million-dollar bills, even if they were legit, I'm not saying, no, they're legit, they're real. Don't try to cash them, they're real. I mean, they're real fake, but they're real. If you were worth this many million, do you think you beat God in that? If your value is this many million, you think you're more valuable than what God thinks you are? No, you can't. So name your value. 
How valuable are you? Stop naming your price. That suggests I'm paying attention to what I need. I'm paying attention to what I don't have. Start naming your value. That says I am rich. Go back to that scripture real quick. It said, God is a sheer, God is sheer mercy and grace, not easily angered. He's rich in love. Go to the dictionary. The dictionary says that rich is having a lot, a great deal of money or assets to be wealthy. Rich means to have a great deal of money or assets. Look up the word asset, and you find it is a useful or valuable thing, person, or quality. When you name your value, you are rich because you are valuable. You might not have a lot of money in the bank, but you have assets. So what are you going to do with them? That was my problem. Like, how, am I, how do I encourage parents that are struggling just like I am, that all we see is our failures? How do I encourage parents like that? I don't know. And then God said, well, Steve, what are you paying attention to? You keep saying you're so poor you can't even afford to pay attention. You're living like you're poor. All you're seeing is what you don't have and what everybody else has, but you're not seeing what you do have and what you need to do with that. If you keep reading on in the scripture, verse 9 of Psalms 103, it says, talking about God here, he doesn't endlessly nag and scold nor hold grudges forever. He, God, doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Aren't you glad for that? Nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. So all the failures that we did with our kids, God doesn't pay us back for that. Someone say right on. As high as heaven is over the earth, so strong is his love to those who fear him. Name your value. Every man has his value. And as far as the sunrise is from sunset, he has separated us from our sins. Now here we go. As parents feel for their children, God feels for those who fear him. He knows us inside and out, keeps in mind that we're made of mud. Men and women don't live very long like wildflowers. They spring up and blossom, but a storm snuffs them out just as quickly having nothing to show they were here. God's love, though, is ever and always, someone say always, eternally present to all who fear him, making everything right for them and their children. Making everything, someone say everything, making everything right for them and their children. Someone sent me a meme the other day of the actor Heath Ledger who took his life, he had a quote in there that said something along the lines of, um, people keep asking you, you know, how are, do, you, do you have cars, do you have houses, do you have, you know, how's the, how's the, the cabin, how's the, he says, but no one ever asks you if you're happy. Which would you rather have? Isn't that why we want the things? Because we think that they'll make us happy? I don't know if this will ever happen for me. If God wants to do it, I'll let him. So if my happiness is based upon this or a smaller version of it, how about this much? Uh, I don't see that happening either. My happiness isn't based upon money. It's based upon a God who is always present, who is rich in love. Then I can name my own value. I have my value, and so do you. But it's time for the next blockbuster. Tom Cruise still looks like he's 19 years old in that stupid movie. How does he do it? He's got to be like 80 years old by now. And he's still doing all the stunts. He's a crazy guy. He's still doing all the stunts, flying the... 
oh man, the movie is unbelievable. It's, it's, I wouldn't know about it. I don't go to movies. I'm a Christian, but I've read the books, you know. And the book describes how his faith, the G-forces, and he's doing all the stunts. And he's showing you that a 50-year-old man still's got it. An 80-year-old man still's got it. You know why? Because you're a blockbuster. And I don't care if it took 36 years for you to figure it out, but it's time for another blockbuster. It's time for you to rise up and show, say, name your value. Every man, every dad has his value. He just needs to name it. And my value doesn't come in the, in the things that I did right or the things that I didn't do wrong. So I did a lot of things wrong, and I didn't do a lot of things right. But it still works out because I fear God, and he covers all of that. So how do I say to a parent that felt like a failure when what they did, maybe they, I mean, work comes and you, you've got to choose family or you've got to make the money for the and you're doing it for the family, but then pretty soon you turn around and your wingman's gone, you're like, what just happened to me here? And you're flying F-16, you're going pretty fast. It doesn't take long before you can get off course. What do I say to them? That it's not true? Well, probably a lot of it is true. I say what you pay attention to will determine whether you're a bad dad or a bad dad. Whether you focus on will determine whether you're a bad dad or you're a bad dad. Bad meaning good or bad meaning bad. It all is determined by who I put my attention on. When you pay attention, you are buying something to bring it home and putting that trophy case inside of your head. Own your mistakes. You've already owned them. Stop buying them. You know those people that have the same thing and they keep buying, they can't. I was listening to the radio the other day and she kept talking about how she, all these coolers she has. I just got to buy more coolers. How many coolers do you need? But we do, we keep buying the same mistakes over and over. We keep paying attention. We keep buying that and own that. We don't need to buy that anymore. You already owned your mistakes. It's time to move on. Peel that skin off the lint roller so that you're valuable again, so you can be in God's hands and he can use you to clean the dirt off other people. But it takes humility to say, God, I'm dirty. Help me. So right now, for those that are interested, we're going to pray. And all you have to do is agree with me if it's what you agree with. We're going to pray. We're going to give God our poor, our lint. We're going to ask him to peel off that skin and say, God, if, if you want to forgive me, I want what I want. I'm going to read the scripture one last time. Just here and there. Verse 6, Psalms 103. God makes everything come out right. He puts victims up on their feet, back on their feet. Verse 8, God is sheer mercy and grace, not easily angered. He's rich in love. Verse 11, as high as heaven is above the earth, so strong is his love to those who fear him. And verse 13, as parents feel for their children, God feels for those who fear him. Jesus, we give you our weakness. We give you our failures. We're sorry for paying attention to the things that we don't have and comparing ourselves to other people. We repent of that. We say we're sorry. We want to get rid of that. We want to focus on the fact that we are rich because you take care of us and you love us and you've got a plan for us. It's going to work out okay. But God, our lives are full of so much people throwing so much darkness that we need you to give us your light. So God, take our lives, peel it back. That's what repent means. It means to give God that layer of the lint roller. So do that right now, at home or online, right here. Take a few seconds and just say, God, take that, that lint off. Peel that back. I want to be fresh again. Your mercies are new every morning. Make me new Today, all you have to do is ask him. That's what he does. God, make me new. I give you my fear, my anxiety, my worry, my anger. I'm scared. I don't know. 
I don't see how we're going to make ends meet by the end of the month, or I don't see the, the solution with my kids, or I don't see that, but I still, God, I still give that to you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. You are now part of the Million Man Club, of the Million Human Club. You are rich. You are not poor. You are rich. To someone else, every one of us in this room has something that someone else wishes that they had. You're rich to somebody. It could be an asset that you have, not even shoes or money or house or car. It could be your personality. It could be your ability to paint. It could be your ability to work on cars. It could be your ability to encourage people. It could be your ability to cook. It could be your ability to, to be hospitable. It could be your ability to make people laugh. But I promise you, there's someone that looks at you or has looked at you somewhere in life and go, man, I'd love to have what they have. You're rich. You have something that somebody else wants. What are you going to do with that thing? I say we give it away. I say we give it away. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, Steve. Hey, before we eat, is the food good to go? Somebody's back there? All right, we're good to go for the food. Let's first of all, let's say thank you to Jeff Mead.